Hi there, I'm Zephyr Scott with HKN, or Ada Kappa Nu at UCLA, and I'm here to talk about MATLAB. This is going to be an introduction to a variety of things that you can do with MATLAB, uh, including an example at the end about using it for presenting plots of convolutions. Um, this isn't a comprehensive uh, tutorial of everything you can do with MATLAB. There's a ton of resources out there that you can use if you'd like to learn more about them. Um, let me show a couple of those resources. Uh, if you go to the MathWorks website, take a look at their MATLAB and Simulate training. Uh, this includes a variety of uh, very in-depth trainings uh, that can include videos and various other resources. And I think a lot of their trainings are generally around two hours or so. Um, so take a look at those, especially if you're interested in uh, using MATLAB at a much more high level. Uh, there's also some kind of introductory te uh, text uh, text-based, excuse me, tutorials. And those are really, really, really useful for uh, just cataloging examples of some commonly used uh, things that will come up a lot, a lot in MATLAB. So good resources. All these links, by the way, will be in the information uh, blurb for the video. If you are at UCLA, you do get a free uh, account, free account uh, with MATLAB, or excuse me, a free license with MATLAB. Uh, if you're not at UCLA, uh, hopefully your school does too, so you can Google the name of your school followed by MATLAB uh, and see if maybe they offer you a license, which is great if they do. So if you are a UCLA student, again, links in the video information, there's a page on how to get MATLAB, and so that talks you through all the processes. Once you have MATLAB, uh, you can go ahead and download it locally onto your computer. You may not have the resources that you need for that. Let's say you have a computer that doesn't have a lot of memory or doesn't have a lot of storage space. You can also remote into the CSNET lab. Uh, again, link will be in the video information. Or another option, once you got your MATLAB account, you can actually use the MATLAB online service. And so this just lets you use MATLAB from your browser. Uh, you can upload files and uh, do all sorts of things that way. Uh, this is a little bit of a slower option, depending on what uh, the size of whatever you're trying to work with. As well, uh, if you're making any plots and you want to export the images, uh, I found that there can be some kind of funky formatting things. So this isn't an ideal uh, resource, but if you need some, some other option other than just uh, using MATLAB locally on your computer, this is a really, really wonderful resource. So without further ado, let's get started. Uh, I'm going to be just using the, uh, using the software locally on my computer. So when you load up MATLAB, it's going to look probably something about like this. Uh, you'll have the ability to direct your current folder at whatever directory you like. I've set up this kind of sample directory uh, that has nothing in it so that it's nice and clean and doesn't have whatever confusion. Uh, you also have your workspace, which we'll get to in a moment, and you have your command window. So this is an interactive environment, so you can do things like 2 plus 3, and it evaluates and you get an answer, which is 5. Uh, you can see that that immediately updated, so it's in the workspace, showing that there is some ants value, that's ants for answer. Uh, the value of ants is five. If I hover over it, I guess there we go. If I hover over it, I can see that that's a one by one double. Well, MATLAB, that stands for Matrix Laboratory. So uh, MATLAB is really designed to be really, really good and really efficient for very uh, large computations because you have a whole bunch of values in your matrix that you're all computing, uh, multiplying against a vector or whatever like that. And that can, of course, get very, very slow if you're not efficiently coding around that. Now, you don't really want to, uh, if, if you're trying to do some extensive matrix computations, you don't necessarily want to have to uh, build a whole bunch of uh, efficient programming backend for how to work with those. You just want to multiply your matrices together and have everything work in the back end quickly and efficiently. So that's what MATLAB will do for you. So the reason it's saying it's a one by one double is this is a one by one matrix. Not super uh, exciting, but very, very, that becomes useful later on. Uh, it's a double because MATLAB just automatically identifies the data type. Uh, you can change this value. So let's say I want to do two times two. Uh, two times two, of course, is four, and you can see that the answer updates. So uh, nice and useful. You can also use strings. doesn't all have to be uh, um, numbers. So word is a string, and you can see that it is a one-by-one one string. Uh, if I type it with single quotes, 
it is a one by four care or car character array. So be aware of that that can cause some uh, some confusion, some issues down the road if you're not paying attention. A good example of how that can cause some um, surprises. Let's say you have two uh, two strings that you're wanting to add together. Uh, adding together strings is a commonly known way to concatenate strings together, and it is usable in MATLAB. So, for example, I've got test is one and word. And so you can concatenate the two and you get one eight character long one by one string. But if I do test and word using single, this is with single quotes, it gives me this array of four numbers. And in fact, if I go ahead and convert those, uh, any of those letters to integers, uh, then you can see that uh, if you know about ASCII, you know that each character uh, each alphabetical character actually corresponds to an integer value in, a, in the computer system. So for example, oops, this is uh, allowing me to convert to an eight-bit integer. What am I converting? I'm converting the letter T. You can see that the T is assigned to the value 116. W, so first letter of test, first letter of W, first letter of word is 119. And if I add those together, 116 plus 119, we get that 235, which is the start of my uh, four number array. So that's what happened when I added together this character array and this character array. Uh, so be aware of that. Be careful when you're working with strings and think carefully. Are you intending to work with an array of characters or any? or a single value that is a string. Uh, some other things. So obviously, if you can only do these kind of little one-off uh, evaluations of equations, that's not, or evaluations of, a, no, of anything you're typing in here, that's not very dynamic. You want to be able to work with variables. So let's work with variables. Uh, variables start with letters. Uh, the rest of the variable can allow for letters, digits, and underscores, and variables allow us to reassign values and work with values in more dynamic ways. So let's say I've got you know, A equals 2 and B equals 3. Now I can do A plus B, and that's 2 plus 3 equals 5. So uh, if you have done any programming before, this is very familiar. If you're not, uh, just run with it and Hopefully it'll uh, keep making sense as we go. Um, but the advantage to this kind of system is that it allow, allows us to use a particular equation or whatever like that on the fly using a variety of different values. You know, if you have your, uh, let's say we've got x equals 6, and you want to use this for some equation. x squared plus, uh, x squared plus 5, well, we can go ahead and assign x to something else x equals 7, and go back to the same equation. Now, I'm using the arrow up key here to go back to previous uh, entries in the interactive editor. And I can uh, change stuff on the fly. So that's really useful. Um, something else to note here, uh, for each of these entries uh, that I'm entering into the interactive window, you can see that it prints out the answer or you know, it evaluates like, oh, this is x equals 7, this is answer equals 54. We can also suppress the output, which you know, you're not always going to want to print out whatever you're doing to the uh, interactive editor. So I can actually say x equals 8, and then use a semicolon. And then it just suppresses the output. Uh, x using our x squared uh, plus 5, I'm suppressing the output. Now, the answer went ahead and updated here, and that's great. Uh, but we don't actually have it. We would have to actually go ahead and say yes. So that's. Uh, useful to know. Let's see what else. Um, reserved keywords. So be aware as you're assigning your variables, if you assign something, uh, as you type in, let's say, for example, I type case. I don't know why you would want to use your use a variable called case, but just in case. Uh, you can see that as I typed, it turned blue. I'm going to delete the E. It's now black again. Type the E. Hopefully, you can see colors. If you can't, I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. Uh, but yeah, so it, this is actually a reserved keyword. You can see a list of the reserved keywords by typing is keyword, and that'll give you a big list. You can see that case is in there. 
And so if you try and assign any of these values to, or treat any of these values as a variable, again, let's say case equals five, I'm gonna get an error. Now it's great at saying you're not allowed to do that, but this is not a comprehensive uh, protection. So an example of this is that same is keyword. You can see that is keyword does not turn blue. This is not gonna be protected. So if I type is keyword equals five, well now I've turned is keyword into a variable. It's no longer going to do what I've already done here. Instead, if I now type is keyword again, it's just gonna give me five. It's, a, it's an assigned variable. And this is a dangerous thing, as you can imagine. So be careful as you're using uh, variables. As you learn more about MATLAB as a language, you'll, you'll get more familiar with what are the different things that you can and can't use. But let's say I've gone ahead and used this in this fashion. I'm thinking, oh no, I still want to know. You know I, I wanted to find out what my list of keywords is or, oh, I shouldn't you know, break the language, you can delete, uh, you can clear this value out. So there's three different ways you can clear out your workspace or clear something in your workspace. One of them uh, is just to right click on the one that you wanted and choose delete. So it's a nice and easy way to use the uh, graphical user interface. Another, let's go ahead and clear out another of these values. I can type clear, clear x, for example, to clear out this x value and that just deleted that one. Or I can clear all of them by typing clear. And that clears the entire workspace. So now if I, for example, type this keyword, it works just like it did before. And yet again, I have my answer value that is just the uh, same as keyword value. Some other ways that you can display stuff. So let's go back to having some you know, test variable that is a string and some other test variable that is a number. Next things, so I can use the display function to uh, display either of these. And notice that when I use the display function, it doesn't display the entire value here of a equals, uh, compared to if I type in a, uh, it, type, it shows me A equals and then this test value in quotes. If I display it, I'm just displaying the portion that is the actual value of the variable. Uh, that, for whatever reason, is with some spacing. Uh, I don't remember offhand why it does that. Uh, there's another function that you can use for somewhat more complicated displays, uh, which is the fprintf function. And fprintf, type while I talk. Uh, this allows us to do things like use variables in our uh, when we're displaying text, and that's uh, especially as you're if you're plotting functions or you're trying to um, do some more dynamic plots. That can be really efficient and save you some time and headache. So an example of this is if I want to go ahead and show this value in, uh, inside of a inside of my text, sorry, <laughs> uh, I can say I am displaying value. Now I'm saying percent %f to show a float value in the text. And what I'm typing after this is the next part of the argument. I want to display this value And I did kind of a silly thing here. I'm going to press it. You can see that the uh, next line is starting at the very end of this line. What I actually want to do to avoid that is put this command here. It's a, a backslash followed by n, and that's just a new line command. So be aware that that's a useful thing. You can even put those in the middle of your text if you want a new line in the middle for whatever reason. But this is a whole lot of digits. Maybe I don't actually want to use this many digits. Uh, I can restrict that by specifying, say I want to have a total of three significant figures. I can say three significant figures uh, with one after the decimal. Uh, if I do, let's say I do something kind of silly like two, uh, then that's going, to be, that's going to go ahead and give me an extra zero, um, I think. I don't know, you can even play around a bit with that and see what exactly is going on with that. I don't use the details of that one too often. Uh, you can also just display integer values. I think that this will just round if I do it this way here. 
No, I don't remember why it does that. Um, if you take a look at the printf function, there's some a fair amount of details on how you can go ahead and modify that to do exactly what you want it, uh, want it to do. Uh, for what it's worth, everything that I'm showing in this tutorial, this is not intended to be comprehensive as much as possible. I want to give you the language you need to go ahead and find more information on specific uh, specific types of things that you want to do in MATLAB because there's no way that I can you know, show you everything comprehensively in a reasonable amount of time, but I'd like to go ahead and give you enough to get started. Uh, let's see, other, other things. Displaying. Uh, Built-in math functions. So obviously MATLAB is great for math purposes. So some built-in functions that you can imagine might be there. Uh, let's use our same B value. Oops, if you uh, mistype the function, it will uh, help you out. Uh, <laughs> sine, cosine functions like those, default to radians, you have to convert to, do, or if you want degrees, you have to do a conversion. Uh, you have things like square root, uh, the, uh, the um, SQRT syntax there is fairly common in a lot of programming languages. And as you might imagine, a lot of what you've seen in, for example, Python, C++, a lot of other programming languages you might have used, a lot of your mathematical functions are going to look extremely similar, if not identical, simply because it's just really convenient. There's no reason to have some completely different syntax. Something to be aware of that trips me up a little bit, uh, logarithms come up a lot in work that I've done. And so, uh, to me, when I'm writing stuff by hand, I'm going to use ln for the natural log, or log to mean base 10, unless I'm indicating that you know, it, it's some other log base, in which case I'll note you know, log you know, base 3 or whatever it is that I need. Well, in MATLAB, the log function is the natural log. Log 10 is the base 10 log. And there isn't a log function that is for the arbitrary base. What you can do if you do need an arbitrary base is you can use the change of base formula. So change of base formula, uh, what I'm typing this not as proper syntax, but just to communicate the idea. Uh, say you have some log base B of X that you want. Uh, you can get that as uh, log base K, some arbitrary K, it doesn't matter. It can be a natural log, it can be base 10, it can be base three, it doesn't matter. Uh, of X divided by log oops, base K, the same base of B. And so because of this, it means that you can use this formula whether you're using the natural log function, the base 10 function, it really doesn't matter. Uh, an example of this, I'm going to just Again, let's see that it's right there in the screen so you can see it, but of course we're not doing anything with it. Uh, let's say I want to get a log, uh, log base three of nine. You know, you hopefully know that my answer should come out as two. So what I want to do here then is I'm just going to use log of nine divided by log of three. And that's two. Hooray, we know it. So let's see here. Uh, another thing that you can do with MATLAB is you can use complex numbers. I'm not really going to go into use of them in this tutorial at any length, but so you're aware of the way you type them is by just typing the real part followed by the imaginary part. Uh, you can use a J or an, or an I, doesn't matter which, it will convert to an I, but it will understand if you type in J. Uh, if you are trying to make it a complex number, but the there isn't a complex part, you just have a real part, then if you type in with a zero, it will look kind of silly. So heads up, uh, if you try, try to do three plus J because it's t the multiplier on the real part, excuse me, on the imaginary part is one, then it'll automatically uh, multiply by one for the display portion. Uh, so heads up, that's what it does. Let's talk a little bit about arrays because again, arrays are a critical part of why we use MATLAB in the first place. Uh, let's see here, so for uh, first, let's talk about making vectors. So an easy way that I can make a vector, it's a, a variable I haven't done. Let's do vec equals, and let's use the colon operator for this one. This is for if I'm trying to, uh, let's go ahead and take a look here. Uh, if I want to just do the numbers counting from 0 to 3, that'll give me an, ar an array. Let's take a look at what that looks like in the workspace. 
so I can hover over the uh, vector um, variable. <laughs> and it shows that I have a one by four double, and that means that it's a one row by four column array of doubles. Uh, and something that I can do, by the way, I uh, use this a lot when I'm working with very, very large uh, arrays, is you can double click on whatever the value is, and you can see it in this uh, tabular form, or I guess, uh, rows and columns kind of spreadsheet sort of form. And so you can actually go ahead and update it directly in here. Um, you can see that that updated here in the value. That isn't necessarily a common usage. It depends on what you're doing, but it's certainly something that is possible. And you can just close that if you're not using it. Um, so that can be a very useful display tool when you don't want to be carefully itemizing exactly what you're looking at. You need to kind of just visually skim through the data because a very, very large array isn't all going to display effectively in the command window. Uh, in fact, a very, very large uh, array often cannot be displayed in its entirety in the command window, and MATLAB will simply abbreviate it. Um, other ways that you can get, get values. So this particular same, let's say you don't want from the numbers from zero to three, you want uh, that, that those values in half steps. So what we can do then is go by half steps. So zero in half steps to three. Looks great. Um, if it does not uh, land exactly on the end point, let's say I want to go in you know, 0.7 steps, then it'll just cut off early and that's fine. Uh, lin space is an, another uh, function you can use. So let's compare again to uh, our zero to three function because that's a very easy one to see the example. So let's look at uh, that could be that could be is lin space. So the lin space function takes zero or takes our starting value, our ending value, and then how many values. Uh, you want in your array. So using the zero to three example, I want four values in my array, nice and simple. For my half steps, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven values. Now this is a really important uh, note here. You can see that, and this is I think something that people can forget sometimes as they're setting up these arrays. When you're starting from zero and going to three as this you know, convenient example, shows we're going by half steps, but we wind up with a total of seven points. So you can imagine, let's say you're thinking, oh, I want to go from zero to three. I want six points for you know, whatever reason. And you think, oh, half steps that you know, divides each of, those, uh, each of those ranges into two parts. Uh, so you know, it's each, into each uh, value from zero to one, one to two, two to three, it divides each of those in halves. So therefore, that's going to give me an even number. And obviously, uh, as you can see, that isn't necessarily going to be the case because you've got your zero value that you also have to consider. So lin spaces is very useful if you know exactly how many uh, points you want but don't necessarily care about or want to calculate where exactly those points are going to fall. Whereas uh, this colon ind uh, operator indexing is really good for if you know where you need those points to fall, but the number of points that you have maybe isn't the priority. Obviously, in, in the case that you need to know both values, you know, use whichever is convenient for you. And as you can see in these examples, it's very simple to use one or the other to accomplish the same exact thing. It just depends on how you look at it. If you're trying to make something that is not just one, uh, excuse me, if you're trying to make something that is a column, you can do that by let's get a D column on it. There's a couple ways you can do that. Let's say you've already got something as a row vector uh, and you just want to make that a column instead. Let's get our vec B, because why not? Uh, you can just apply a prime to it. And that will go ahead and pivot that to be a column. Uh, you can also create a column vector from scratch using semicolons. Now dimensions you have to agree, so you can't do something like one, three, to have two values in the first row. That's going to give me an error. Um, but you can, it's a, a shorter matrix for convenience. You can make matrices of various dimensions, and that's not a problem. 
Uh, you can do a variety of mathematical operations. Oh, let me get to that in just a moment. A couple of other quick ways. Obviously, these are, uh, we just looked at some good ways that you can automatically generate a lot of numbers in a particular matrix, um, numbers with a particularly known um, spacing. You can also make, you know, completely arbitrary and customized uh, values in your matrix or in your array. You don't have to uh, um, have something that's automatically generated. Sometimes you may need the same value everywhere, so a couple of good ways for that. Uh, it's pretty common to need zeros, just like an array of all zeros. So zeros, uh, if I type just one value in the argument, oops, then that'll give me an array of three rows and three columns. If I use two values, the first will be the number of row. First value is the number of rows. The second value is the number of columns. Uh, I can also do that with ones, which is very useful if, say, I need an array of ones, uh, so an array of, say, sevens. I don't know. I can just multiply, and you can see that this is a really good step towards the next important thing, which is uh, that you want to do mathematical operations with these vectors. So some things that you can do. Uh, let me look at what vectors you've already got here. Uh, I'm going to just make a couple of vectors really quick to demonstrate what I'm doing. So I have an A vector, which I'm going to make as just one, two, three. Nice, convenient. Uh, I'm going to make a B vector, which is going to be A prime plus one. So this is going to turn into a column, and then add one to each value in the, uh, in the array just like that. I'm also going to just set up C for comparison's sake, which is just going to be B prime, because that's what I wanted it to be. This is also, note that C is equivalent here to just doing A plus one. Same thing. I'm going to go ahead and delete or clear some of the values that I'm not using just to keep the workspace clean. I'm going to clear that E. So I'm mainly concerned with, oh, let me clear the vectors up. So I'm mainly concerned with A, B, and C, and we're just going to ignore ants that will populate as we go, or it doesn't matter. So some things you can do. Uh, multiplying matrices or multiplying arrays in general, uh, A times B. As you can imagine, this is going to give you a dot product, and you can calculate to verify that that's the accurate dot product between the row one, two, three and the column two, three, four. Note that you do have to be mindful of your dimensions. A times C, this is the multiplication of two rows. Well, you can't do a valid dot product between two uh, rows. You have to do a, a dot product between a row and a column. So that's going to give you an error. But uh, there is a dot product function. This is, oops, dot A, B. And this function will actually transpose for you as needed. You can do the dot product between the two rows or a row and a column, and it doesn't make a difference. As you might imagine, there's also a cross product, and that operates similarly. Oops. You can do a cross product of the two rows or a cross product of uh, the row and the column, and you'll get the same value either way. Some other things you can do, you can do some uh, Let's say what you actually wanted to do was you wanted to multiply item-wise. You can do A times C, but put a dot before your, uh, before your multiplier. Uh, if you're not familiar with programming, by the way, notice that for multiplication, I'm using an asterisk. I'm not using an X. So if you're new to programming, welcome. Glad to have you aboard. Uh, that's how you multiply. Uh, in this particular case, I'm doing uh, element-wise multiplication. And so that'll do 1 times 2 is 2. 2 times 3 is 6, 3 times 4 is 12. Uh, if I do the same thing um, using uh, element-wise row, uh, my, yeah, my row vector times my column vector, it actually gives me this 3 by 3 matrix. Well, what's it doing here? Uh, notice that I've got this 2. That 2 is 1 times 2. This 4 is the second element in A, 2, times the first element in B, Two, so that gives me a four. And then this six is the third element in A, three, times that same first element in B. So again, we have our column, two, three, four, of B, and our rows are each being multiplied by each value in B. 
I can kind of really see this by thinking, okay, well, if we have A times just the first value of B, notice that right now I'm just doing regular multiplication, not element-wise multiplication, because I'm only multiplying by a scalar, not by an entire vector. And that just gives me the first row of B. Well, there's another way that I can actually use this in an interesting way right now. Let's take a look at uh, um, indexing of, that, of values in an array. So I've got my a times uh, a times two. Well, this should be equivalent to a times just the first value in b. So let's grab the first value in b. Uh, here's a funky thing about MATLAB. Notice that gives me the same value. Uh, if you have programmed before, you're probably very used to arrays starting from position zero and going to the position one less than the length of your array. If you have an array of three values, you're going to index those as the value in position zero, the value in position one, the value in position two. MATLAB, it goes from position one to position three. So heads up, uh, if you're trying to port over some, uh, some calculation or structure or whatever that you've set up in some other language and you're just tr you're thinking, oh, it's mathematical stuff, there's just a couple of changes here and there to make the syntax match up, this is a big one, it can screw some things up. So be careful. But you can see that here, instead of multiplying A uh, by this one scalar value, I've multiplied A by the same scalar value obtained by accessing B1. You can see that if I just look for B1, that same scalar value is now being assigned to answer. That's all I've got here. Uh, I can index for more than one value. I can go from row one to, excuse me, from the first value to the second value. So that gives me two values there. And again, if I want to multiply in that same fashion, if I still use just the regular multiplying rather than the dot, uh, dot multiplication, I'm going to get an error because now I'm multiplying by this vector. So here's a way that I get just a two by three uh, matrix. Um, I'm going to let's see here. I uh, showed getting the prime. Uh, you can invert. Um, matrices, so that's useful. Let me go ahead and make a larger matrix here. Uh, this is a particular example that I came up with earlier because I know it's invertible. So there's some matrix, and I can invert this just like that. Oops. Hopefully, by typing it correctly, note case sensitivity, uh, case matters. So that'll give you the inverse. Uh, you can also get the transpose, just like we did earlier uh, with the prime. And that gets Yeah. Forgot how I had A assigned there. Yes, this is valid. But I only want the, uh, uh, so if I wanted that transpose for something, I can assign it to something else. Just creating values. Now, you may know uh, one of the core things that comes up in linear algebra, or at least one of the core things, especially in lower level classes you'll deal with, is the need to do things like for, a, uh, for a, something like AX equals B, where A is some matrix, X is some vector, uh, and B is some vector. A times X equals B, well, you may have your B vector, and you may have your A matrix, but you need to solve for X. And because it's a uh, matrix, you can't just divide both sides by A. You actually have to multiply both sides by A prime, um, excuse me, by A inverse, by, <laughs> by A prime. And so you can do that in a couple of different ways here that are very useful. Um, let's use, I'll just use, uh, I think we had B, is, yeah, let's go ahead and do, say, some other call, uh, some other one is, uh, oh, actually, I don't need a second vector. Um, let's say I got this B vector, I got the A uh, matrix that I've already assigned here, and I just want to find out the X for that same AX equals B. So one way that I can do that is by typing, by getting inverse of A times B. And that gives me this uh, X vector. Another way that I can do it is by using the backslash operator. So I can say a backslash b 
and that's going to give me my same exact value. No, note in this particular case, one displays, uh, or here it's being displayed with, uh, um, with doubles without a zero uh, at the end. Here it's being displayed with doubles with a zero at the end. There may be uh, some like slight rounding error at the very, very end there. Um, so be aware as you're working with these, if you're ever trying to compare values and you're getting something that tells you that two values are equal, but, or excuse me, two values are not equal, but you're like, well, this one's 7.00000, this one's just seven. Uh, it might be having an, an issue there. There's, um, I'm not gonna go into a lot of the ways that you can check for that, but that, just be mindful of that. Um, there's a number of ways that you can look for this uh, in terms of like critical cancellation or uh, margin of error, various things like that. Uh, a couple other things about indexing values. Oh, let's let's say we're trying to index a value in this uh, matrix A. I lost it. I'll just type in matrix A. Uh, let's say I want to get the second row and the first column. That's just going to be A second row, first column. Nice and easy, and that's a one. Let's say I want to get this these first four values here. I can type that as one to two. And I guess maybe for a for a more interesting example, we can get these this square here, this one one zero five. Uh, so that would be, I guess, two to three, and then one to two because we're only interested in the first two columns. And that just gives us that same square. Next, let's look at scripts. So uh, obviously if you're just working in the command window, that's gonna get pretty not useful at a certain point because you can't do your like mass amounts of coding uh, effectively or efficiently in this command window. And of course, at some point you'll want to store stuff. So let's go ahead and look at storage and scripts. So to create a script, we just kind of, or excuse me, you can click the new button here. If you just click the plus sign, then it defaults to give you a script. If you click the arrow down, you've got a few different options. Personally, I only ever really use script, and sometimes I'll use function. We'll get into that in a moment. Uh, I'm sure that the rest of these things are very useful in other circumstances that have not come up for me personally. Um, I, I'm actually pretty new to using function. Usually I just write the function directly into script. Uh, that doesn't really make a big difference uh, down the road, but I can show you that in a moment what's going on there. Uh, another way that you can make a script or function is by right clicking in the current folder. Uh, now, that'll look like you know, something like this. Again, you click the option, you can choose any of these different options. You can also make a new folder. So a slight, uh, something to be aware of is that with this untitled, if I try to run it, obviously there's nothing to do there, but if I try to run it, it's not gonna let me do anything until I save it. So I'm just gonna call this test. Oops. And that's gonna plop it down in the current folder. In a similar vein, if I do new script, very first thing it's going to do is actually create something and require me to name it something before I do anything with it. So I'm just gonna delete that because I don't need it. Cool, let's go ahead and uh, make some scripts. So some common things to be aware of, uh, data structures that you'll see in other programming languages uh, tend to exist here as well. Uh, some common things that you'll need to know are things like loops or conditionals. So an example of a loop is a for loop. Uh, for a for loop, you need an, uh, an array for your value to, uh, or for your loop to go through. So a common example of that might be, so you've got for i equals zero to three. Uh, now note here that I automatically have this red squiggle saying an n might be missing. So the important syntax that we're going to always have at the end of our uh, structure is this n. Now obviously nothing's gonna happen here. Uh, but I'm just drawing this for a point of comparison. If, you, if you've used something like C++, you're probably used to using brackets to indicate structures. In this case, uh, structure of being as in like a data structure, not as in a struct. Um, in this case, you're using ends to indicate the end of your for loop. You'll use ends to indicate the end of your if conditional. You'll use end for the end of your function. So that's what end is for. Uh, and you're not, in this case, using brackets. So you have to be mindful of where those ends are and uh, keep an eye on stuff like indentation and stuff because otherwise terrible things happen. So zero to three, you probably remember from before that this is going to give me an array from zero to three counting by ones. If I wanted to use half steps, I can absolutely do that here. So let's go ahead and use that as a good example. 
we're counting i in half steps from 0, 0.5, 1, 1.5, all the way up to 3. And let's use that display function that we talked about earlier. We're just going to display i for each one of these. And I can click run, or I can press F5. They work the same. You can see that if I hover over the uh, run button, it tells me that that will save and run test. And I can do that by pressing F5. And there it goes. It just displays each one of these values in the loop. Let's say I want to use a conditional. This is an if. Um, this gets a little bit into uh, that uh, some of that matching issue that we can potentially get. Let's say if I'll use it as a compare. I'll use a comparison just because I don't want to overcomplicate things. Let's say I want to say if uh, actually the parentheses i is greater than one point five. Parentheses you don't need it here. Notice that again, I'm getting that red squiggle because I only have one end for both of these. Something's missing, and if I try and run it now, I'm going to get an error. At least one end is missing. The statement may begin here. So let's go ahead and give an end. It automatically fixes the indentation for where it thinks that that belongs. And fortunately, in this case, it's correct. And now it only goes ahead and prints the i value for 2, 2.5, and, and 3 because those are values that are greater than i. And again, conceptually thinking what's happening through here, or i equals zero, it's going to start with zero. It will say if i is greater than 1.5, well, it's not. So nothing's going to happen. It will go back into the loop and try again with 0.5, and then again with 1, and so on. Uh, let's take a look at custom functions. So I'm going to show two different ways to make a function. Uh, one way you can make a function is, again, by creating a new function, either in here, or you can just do it by creating a script. I'm going to do it right now using the uh, function approach just because it's a useful thing. And let's go back to that logarithm example just because it's you know, an example we've already looked at a bit, and that makes it very convenient. So I'm going to call my function here log b because it's convenient. I know that my input values for the function, I'm going to make this a bit wider here, my input values for the function are going to be my x value and my b value. As you can see, I can, uh, or this value here, this is whatever the function is going to return when you call the function. Uh, when you're talking about returning a value, uh, when we have, for example, our sine of 3.14, I did not do something too goofy, but it does not matter. This will be something very close to zero, of course. Uh, this value is close to zero. That's the return value. That's your y equals sine of x. And so in your function, this value here that I have highlighted, that's your y. Log b in the case of sine, that would be look something like so there's your kind of comparison. Well, let's say what you want in this particular you want to create your own sine function. In this case, we're creating our log function where you want to return some other value. You don't want just the mathematical evaluation. You also want, you know, anything. It doesn't, you know, there can be all kinds of things that you want for that. Maybe you've got some value where you actually explicitly want to return vector, uh, a vector for some reason based on scalar input. You can return more than one value. You just have to treat it as a vector by putting it in these uh, square brackets. But in our case, we just want to return one value. So let's go ahead and call that y. Uh, when you use the create new function tool as opposed to creating a new script tool, you can see that it uh, automatically goes ahead and uh, gives me this value over here. I can give some description of the function. It's good to give comments in your code. Uh, comments are anything that's following this parentheses symbol. So be aware that when you're using parentheses, that is for uh, commenting. And comment just means that anything that's in this text that follows the parentheses is not going to it, the, uh, is, is going to get ignored by MATLAB. It's there for you to present comments. Excuse me. Uh, note that let's say I'm trying to you know keep my formatting nice, I'm thinking, oh, I'm typing, typing, and it's very, very long, and I want to go to the next line. Once I continue typing, this text is no longer green, like this uh, um, comment text is. It's back to black. That means that it's no longer comment text. So be aware of that. I'm not going to use comments for now. Um, now you can see here, I've got these, it says output arg1. That was one of the values listed in this um, return value. Input arg1 was one of the values that was previously in the input. 
So let's go ahead and just use our same function that we had from before. Uh, we know that we want our return value. It's going to be y, and that's going to be log x divided by log b. And that's our function. That, that's literally it. I'm going to suppress the output because otherwise when I run this function, I'm going to get something funny out there. I'm going to save it using my same log b name. That's great. And we can go ahead and now use the function by saying, OK, well, I want the log b. Oops, I don't have it typed in there. Log b of, what was it? We had a n, or n, 9, excuse me. Log b was, uh, we wanted the log of 9 with base 3. And we get 2. That's great. That's exactly what we want. There's another common way that you're going to potentially want, oh, and so something to note here, sorry, is that, again, we talked a little bit about this being the current folder. This current folder, this current directory, any function that is in here, such that the name of the function, the name of the script, I should say, is the name of the function, you can access that in your command window, you can access that in some other uh, script using that same folder. So for example, Here, I just ran the same, uh, same script that we had before. It outputs my same two, two and a half, three. And because this log value did not have the uh, semicolon after it, uh, log b of nine and three, we didn't assign it to any variable. We didn't suppress the output. It just printed right there to the, uh, oops, <laughs> to the answer. So you can access that function anywhere. Well, another thing that I can do, maybe I don't want a function accessible everywhere entirely. I'm just going to copy this out. I'm going to access the oops, here in this function. And for sake of, here's a, a convenient tool if you don't have some sort of versioning resource around for whatever reason, let's just put some value into, a, into your file name to get it out of the way. Now I will no longer be able to execute this function because that function doesn't exist anywhere that the command window knows to look at it. But it is still in this test uh, in this test script, which still functions just like it did a moment ago, where it prints out the uh, output for my function uh, for my for and if loops, my for loop with my if inside, excuse me, and then it outputs this value of the log. Uh, note that if I put this, uh, if I call this log function at the end, then I get this error. So uh, the function, if you're trying to add any function definitions that are unique to the scripts, like it says, you have to put them at the end of the file. So that can be an effective way to organize your code if you have functions that are only useful for that particular script. Uh, something like the logarithm code, I might go ahead and keep in a convenient place because I would use that a lot. All right, so with that, uh, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to give an example of a graphical convolution. Um, just to keep this a little bit clean, I'm going to put this as a separate video. So that will be linked as well in the uh, information about this video. So check it out. Thank you so much.